Welcome to our show. This is Zan Khan. Today, the topic of our show is quantum transactions. Today, we're going to philosophically and scientifically understand this big topic. Today,、uh, the guest of our show is Ruth Kastner, who is an author and also a philosopher of physics. Welcome to our show, Ruth Kastner. This is Zan Khan. It's a pleasure to have you on our show. Thanks very much. It's always a pleasure. Ruth Kastner, let's get to the first question. What is a transaction? Well, what I call a transaction is、um, a two-way process. And what's new about this, and actually, I should give credit to、uh, John Kramer, who was the inventor of this particular interpretation of quantum theory, and he he called it the transactional interpretation. And it's different from the usual approach to quantum theory, because it treats the quantum processes as a two-way process. So that instead of just having a quantum system like a little particle or something else that we would use、uh, quantum theory to describe, we、um, we have this quantum system that we describe by what's called a quantum state. But in the transactional interpretation, we don't just have that system. We also have that system interacting with physical systems that are absorbers, and basically they can respond to this quantum system that's described by the quantum state. And when they respond, they generate a particular kind of、um, almost like a mirror image quantum state. And so that instead of just having like a little photon、uh, propagating around, we have a response to that that photon, and that response is called a confirmation. And the the original little state that that is emitted is called an offer. So according to the transactional picture, the usual quantum objects are just offers, and they're not the whole story about what's going on. So we have offers, and we have、uh, those offers interacting with absorbers, and the absorbers respond to those offers with these confirmations. So it's a two-way process, and that two-way process is called a transaction. And it's you can kind of think of it as a handshake. It's a like an emitter reaching out its hand to an absorber, and many times there are, there's more than just one absorber. There are other many absorbers in general. And these absorbers all kind of reach, extend another hand in return, and you have a whole bunch of kind of quantum handshakes going on. And in general, you only have one of those that turns into a real event. So that's called an actualized transaction, and it's through that actualized transaction that the real energy that's contained in a quantum of light, which is called a photon, it's through that actualized transaction that that real energy gets. Transferred from that emitter to that absorber, that sort of gets the the winning absorption. Does it take a conscious observer、uh, to get a result? No. The thing about the transactional picture is you don't need to sort of invoke a conscious observer. You don't need to say, "Well,、uh, we've got quantum theory and we've got these entanglements, and they seem to be telling us that everything's in a weird quantum superposition." So somehow we have to say, well, when I when I have a consciousness involved,、uh, somehow my consciousness only sees one particular outcome. We don't need to do that in the transactional picture because we have absorption, and absorption is a physical process that really does generate these these confirmations in a very physically rigorous way. You get this measurement outcome. You get a situation where you have a well-defined Outcome, and you don't need to kind of say, "Well, something strange has to happen. Something that's outside the theory. Something that's beyond the physical systems that the theory seems to be describing." And that's why people bring in consciousness because they sort of feel like they can't do without it. But, but in a way, you can do without it to address what measurement and and how you get specific outcomes in the transactional picture. Then a very important question arises: Then how does consciousness enter into the theory? Well, we don't strictly need to bring in consciousness in the transactional picture, so we don't have to say,、uh, 
well, you know, this is a physical theory, and it, but it still has to account for consciousness. Traditionally, in physics, you know, it, it's only because of quantum mechanics that people are saying, well, physics, you know, the field of physics now has to explain consciousness to me. In, in the transactional picture, we return to a situation where physics, it's not really the province or the, the domain of physics to explain mental experiences and to explain consciousness. But the nice thing about the transactional picture is, is it doesn't say, well, you can't have consciousness or it doesn't rule it out. And it actually does allow for the idea that, that if you think of the mind as, as a more abstract kind of, kind of object or entity than matter, well, in a sense, quantum objects are more abstract too. And you can, you can speculate, and this is just speculative, it doesn't have to be part of the theory itself or part of the interpretation, but you can speculate that the mind might be a quantum entity. And in that sense, there's a natural place for the mind to enter as, as a part of that quantum realm that we can't see, you know, just like we can't see quantum objects apart from measurement results. And we can't see the mind either, but in some sense, the mind might actually be a quantum entity. So, again, the nice thing about the transactional picture is we don't have to appeal to mental processes to explain measurement, but we also have a way to, to say, well, the mind, the mind might be part of the quantum realm. And so, in some sense, it could have a role to play in uh, saying why certain outcomes occur and not others. We could have a place for volition to enter. And I think we talked about that last time in terms of free will. Okay, last question. Uh, what does this have to do with spooky action at a distance? Well, the spooky action at a distance is, is being talked about a lot lately. Um, there's a new book out by George Musser, who is a um, popular blogger at Scientific American. He has a new book that is entitled Spooky Action at a Distance. And one of the things that bothered Einstein about quantum theory was that you seem to have in these so-called entangled states that are states where you have uh, a several systems that are entangled with each other, that they seem to communicate faster than light. They, they just seem to do things and influence each other in a way that seems to be spooky. It just seems to be uh, something that, that involves a, a ghostly sort of connection that, that doesn't seem to be explained in terms of physics as we're used to it, in terms of relativity and so on. Um, and one way to think about this is that um, in the transactional picture, as I've developed it, and I think I talked about this previously a little bit, these quantum objects really are, are objects that are, in a sense, too big. They have too many dimensions to fit into space-time. So they're, they're, they have their existence in a, a kind of domain that is, is really outside space-time. It's like a fundamental domain that, that lies beyond space-time, and it can't really be fit into space-time. So the idea is that there's more to reality than the world of appearance, which is that space-time world. And so because these objects are, are sort of too big to fit into space-time, that's what allows them to do things that, that seem like they're communicating faster than light. To understand this a little bit, we, we can think about this wonderful story called Flatland that was written in the 19th century. And the idea is there's a, there's, um, a land that is just a flat plain. And there are inhabitants of that plane, and one of them's a square. And they, they don't know about three dimensions. They can't experience that. And so their world is, to them, the only thing they can experience is this flat world. And so at one point, this square who lives in Flatland is visited by a sphere, which is a mysterious object from three dimensions, you know, which seems perfectly normal to us. But to the square, the sphere can do things that just seem magical and, and non-local. And so if we, if we kind of put our, our minds in, in the mindset of that, that poor little square who was being visited by this strange creature that was multidimensional, that has, was bigger than, than could fit into the square's domain of, of, uh, of his viewpoint that he's, he can experience, then in the same way, we, we are being visited by these quantum objects that, that are too big to fit into our restricted three-dimensional space-time. They're just... They're larger, and so they, that allows them to do these things and have these relationships that seem to us to violate our ordinary laws because they, they obey a different kind of law, and that's the law of quantum mechanics. And that law describes objects that really 
are bigger than our space-time world. Thank you so much, Ruth Kastner, for being on our show. It was a pleasure having you. Thanks very much. It's always a pleasure. This was Ruth Kastner, an author and also a philosopher of physics. She helped us understand uh, the concept of uh, quantum transactions. Until the next show, this is Zan Khan. Take care and goodbye. Thank you.